All right. Thank you, everybody, for taking the time to join us uh, this evening. I hope everybody staying safe and healthy. Uh, I want to say hello. Uh, my name is Marcus Schweitzer. I am the executive director of the Win the Arab Pack. Uh, we are thrilled to have everybody here tonight to talk a bit more about uh, the pack and kind of the next steps uh, with for Mayor Pete. And so without further ado, I turn it over to the mayor. All right. Well, hi, everybody. Thanks so much for joining. I'm, I'm really excited to uh, be with you. It's wonderful uh, seeing all the, the kind words coming through on the chat and uh, uh, seeing faces from around the country. We're uh, 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 all getting used to this new Zoom era, and uh, I wish I was able to gather with you in person, but uh, this is a pretty good second best. And uh, uh, first and foremost, most importantly, I hope you're doing all right. I hope you're keeping safe and that uh, you and your loved ones are getting through this uh, all right. Uh, I know it's a, a challenging time for everybody. Uh, and uh, at the same time, I'm convinced more than ever that it's going to bring the best out of us if, if we make sure that that's a reality. And that's why uh, it's so important to me that we stay in touch, that I stay in touch with you, that uh, supporters of our efforts stay in touch with each other. And that's what we have a chance to do through opportunities like this uh, and through efforts like Win the Era. So, we have created a nonprofit organization and a political action committee uh, called Win the Era, uh, whose purpose is to carry forward the values that uh, animated our campaign. Uh, and while I'm uh, certainly going to be putting a lot of my time and energy out there to make sure that we get the White House back into the right hands and get Joe Biden elected president. We're also going to be doing a lot of work on some of the races and efforts that are not getting the same level of attention. You'll remember that during the campaign, I always talk about how we can't treat the presidency like it's the only office that matters. We've got to pay attention to local office, to state office. And if there was ever uh, a time to see how important that is, it's now where because we don't have the, the leadership we need in the White House, uh, we're seeing uh, governors, we're seeing mayors, we're seeing unsung uh, county and other local officials stepping up to uh, to deal with issues. And, and that's why it's so important that uh, we're supporting people up and down the ticket. Uh, I'm also going to continue to have a presence speaking for the values that we all came together around in this effort, the things that uh, brought us all to the table, uh, the rules of the road in terms of how we believe campaigning should be done, uh, and the specific policy areas that we know are so important, our, our vision of how freedom and democracy and security can uh, be supported and, and, and really uh, get the, the leadership that we need on the road ahead. The stakes could not have been higher, and then they got higher. That's how I feel about what's uh, what's happening right now. And that's why it's uh, uh, more important than ever for us to stay strong, to find new ways uh, to be involved. So it's not as uh, straightforward as just uh, going down in person to uh, to an event. Um, and, uh, you know, I continue to be so proud of the community of supporters that we have, not just everything that you did in the campaign, which I'll never be able to thank you enough for, but also uh, seeing online and through social media, the different things that Team Pete are doing, how uh, each of you have found ways uh, to lift one another up, to be involved, to stay engaged, and that's only going to be more important. So uh, I'm really excited to be with you. Uh, I know that, uh, uh, and this is new for us, we're, we're, uh, I think we got the, the technology and the protocol set up, and we'll be able to uh, take live questions from folks uh, on the call, and uh, really looking forward uh, to jumping into that conversation. So I'll uh, kick it back to Marcus to uh, uh, guide us uh, through the chat. Great. All right. Well, we've got a couple of questions. Do we have a, a Wendy from Loveland? Wendy, can you make sure you're, you're unmuted and ask a question? Mute myself. There I go. I'm good. Hi, Mayor Pete. Um, my question is, there is so Hello. much misinformation out there. Hi, can, can you hear me? This is Wendy from Loveland. Yes, I got you. Can you hear me, Wendy from Loveland? Hi. Um, Hi, and hi, Mayor Pete. Um, there seems yes. to be a lot of confusion about as, the re <clears throat> as everyone gets ready to reopen their states and their communities, um, there's a lot of misinformation about how important the testing is so that we know where we are in the uh, COVID-19. Um, just it just depends on who you're talking to as to whether they feel it's important or not i'm in northern colorado uh governor polis uh spoke to everyone yesterday um telecommuting and basically it sounded as though 
the testing of trying to test everyone in every community is just not going to be doable. Um, how do we know that when we open up that it's going to really be safe to open up? Is it just the data that we follow? So first and foremost, you're right, there's a lot of misinformation going on out there. And so it's, an important, it's so important to uh, listen to trusted and objective leaders. Uh, I got to know Governor Polis during the campaign. Uh, I think he's terrific and, and uh, really uh, appreciate the leadership that he's showing us, as so many governors have. Um, if you look through my Twitter feed, you'll see earlier today, I tweeted about a report that came out from a group, uh, a team that I've been working on, uh, based at the, uh, the, the Safra Center for Ethics, but involving experts from around the country from uh, different disciplines and different fields. And uh, what, uh, what is emerging there is that widespread massive testing is the only way we can fully get back to normal. Uh, so in the meantime, there may be areas where it becomes safe to begin partial reopening. But ultimately, in order, in my view, in order for us to be able to safely reopen this summer, uh, as we might be able to do, we're going to have to do a lot of testing. As a matter of fact, the experts uh, in the report that I would definitely encourage you to take a look at say that we would need between 5 million and 20 million tests a day. That sounds uh, like, well, obviously it is a lot, and it sounds like a, an almost uh, unbelievable number. We could do it if we took certain steps. As a country, we would need to step up production of tests in a way that's comparable to the wartime production boards uh, in World War II that made it possible for us to have enough Jeeps and, 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 and rubber tires and airplanes in order to, uh, to deliver. That could be done. And uh, there, a framework has been put forward for how to do it. It'll take money. But uh, the billions of dollars it would take to deliver testing at that scale are dramatically less than even a few more weeks than uh, necessary of physical distancing. And so uh, we really need to find a way as a country to mobilize so that we can do that testing. Now, the testing is just the beginning. We've also got to be able to uh, do the contact tracing uh, of people who test positive. And that's why uh, the, the experts estimate we'll need to bring on about 100,000 people more to participate in that effort. Think, for example, of all the people being hired in neighborhoods around the country as census enumerators every 10 years. It's kind of like that. And there may be a role for national service organizations uh, to help make that possible. So uh, uh, my point is that this is an all-hands-on-deck effort, and we do need access to that testing data to really know whether it's safe to reopen. Because there are so many people who have it who don't know that they have it. Uh, there are a few places around the world, one uh, part of Iceland, another part of Italy, where they've actually begun testing the entire population of an area or uh, randomly sampling testing. So that soon we hope we'll get uh, better numbers about how many people are symptomatic. In some groups that have been tested, fully half of the people who were positive did not uh, have any symptoms at all. Uh, and so that number may or may not hold uh, for the big picture. But uh, what, what we know is that this shows us the importance of testing. And uh, unfortunately, the president is uh, not showing leadership on this, but that doesn't mean that it can't happen. Uh, and so I'm continuing to work with this group of experts to link them to mayors around the country, uh, who uh, I've come to know through the community of mayors uh, and uh, get their feedback. By the way, we're talking about mayors from both parties who don't get caught up in the partisan nonsense. Uh, and don't get uh, sucked into this White House's rhetoric, um, because uh, the reality is that uh, this, this virus doesn't care what party you're in, and uh, it's as dangerous to, uh, to people who voted one way as it is to people who voted another. Um, so uh, bottom line, massive testing with a lot of contact tracing is the road to opening. And if we do it, then we no longer have to be in this debate where some people are saying, you know, reopen now which is incredibly dangerous. And others are fearing that we have to uh, go through this economic pain forever. There is a way to avoid that choice. And that is through massively increased testing. Thank you, Mayor. Our next question comes from Aaron from Austin. Aaron, can you try to unmute your line? Are you online? Hey, Marcus. Hey, um are gonna come back to Baron. We're just finding his microphone, but we have Ryan from Boston. Uh, Ryan, you should be free to go. And you might need to unmute yourself there too. Hey, 
Okay, we'll give Brian a sec. Thanks everyone for um, your flexibility and for helping us helping us manage this tonight. Um, let's see, uh, Linda, we are going to come to you, Linda from Brighton. See here. Yes, I'm here. All right, Linda, if you are there, yes, we got you loud and clear. Yay, I'm here. Okay. First of all, hello, Mayor Pete. I was really inspired by your campaign. Hello, uh, how are you? I'm fine. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Um, I was really inspired by your campaign, and I was thinking Good. You know, Thank you. of you're welcome. And I was thinking of all sorts of policy questions to ask you, but I decided, especially with the the wall of books behind you to ask, what are some of the books that you've been reading during quarantine? Uh, well, thanks for asking. Uh, um, <clears throat> one of my favorite subjects and, and this, uh, these bookshelves represent a, uh, uh, my triumph in furniture assembly. The first one came in, took a better part of a Saturday to put it together. And now I'm getting pretty proficient at these and uh, organizing a, a library that's been accumulating in the house for, for some time. Uh, and uh, uh, it feels good to be able to have the time to read something longer than a, uh, a campaign memo or, or an email or a tweet. Uh, and there are a lot of things that are uh, really relevant. Um, let me, uh, I'll give you kind of an insider uh, uh, thing, which is I've realized that uh, um, when I appear on TV from, from this seat, people pay a lot of attention to uh, the books that are behind me. Uh, and at first they were just randomly arranged because I was cleaning the room, but I decided this is going to be my shelf of stuff that, uh, uh, that I'm looking at right now. Uh, either uh, new, new books or, or, or books that I think have new meaning at the moment. Um, so just a, a few things that I would point to right now. Sorry, you got me started on a favorite subject. Oh, that's great. Um, there's a book here on called The Public Option, and it's not just about the public option for healthcare. Uh, the authors actually developed a general theory about public options. They pointed out that the post office is a public option, and one, by the way, that we need to fund uh, in order to, uh, to get the services we need. Uh, public libraries represent a kind of public option. Uh, and so it's a really smart look more broadly at policy issues that can be solved uh, with a quality public option. I just got a sneak peek at a book that's not gonna come out until June, but it's by Bob Putnam, the author of Bow Bowling Law. Uh, who's been, I think, one of America's most important thinkers on how we uh, how we uh, feel as individual communities or get isolated. It's called The Upswing, and uh, what he's done and a team of researchers he's worked with have assessed how uh, not just economic inequality, but social and political and cultural cohesion all were at a really low point in about the 1880s, the Gilded Age. And then through a lot of policy work, got better and better by the middle of the century, and then started getting worse again. That's kind of, for example, uh, combating inequality. This is the curve. We start the clock in the 1880s, and we're kind of living back down here in a period uh, that, that re resembles a lot of the problems that we had 100 or 120 years ago. So I'm just dipping into it, but uh, I think it's pretty compelling. Um, <clears throat> this is a good time for novels. Uh, it's not on my shelf here, but uh, the third novel in the Wolf Hall series has come out by Henry Mantel. It's about England at the time of Henry VIII. Uh, it's great uh, if you're interested in politics, uh, and, or if you're not, it's, it's just a, a great uh, read because it's very psychological, but, uh, but also uh, timely. And then um, this one's got my attention. <clears throat> it came out a few years ago. Um, it's just, it's called debt. It's a history of the idea of debt. And the author from the very beginning talks about some really provocative things. It goes back 5,000 years. He demonstrates that the concept of debt probably existed before the concept of money. The reason this is important is because well, one reason it's important is we're going through such economic upheaval, right? And of course, a lot of the biggest debates that we've had in 2020 and beyond have been about debt, medical debt, student debt, national debt. Uh, and we're through the looking glass now when it comes to just how profoundly our economic realities are going to change. So I think uh, uh, I picked that book up years ago, but I think it's, it's probably going to have new meaning um, uh, right now. So um, those are a few that, uh, that have my attention. And uh, um, I'm always uh, uh, eager to geek out with, uh, with supporters on uh, books that might have your attention. So I'll uh, keep an eye on the chat window or elsewhere for uh, ideas you might have on books that I might like. 
Great. Thank you so much. Very interesting. Thank you, Linda. Uh, next up, we have uh, Nicole from Green Bay. Nicole, are you on the line? And if you are, please unmute yourself. Uh, I, I can read the question for you. So uh, following up from that, uh, Nicole from Green Bay asks, uh, Nicole asks, what have you recently been enjoying that you didn't expect to like? Um, <clears throat> doing dishes. It's a, <laughs> it's a chore, but actually just being home <laughs> and, uh, especially because Chaslin, it turns out is a wonderful cook. Uh, and so our division of labor is, he does the, uh, uh he does the, the, the really creative demanding part that you can, uh, uh you can easily mess up. I do the uh, the simpler part, so uh, it's uh, I don't know. There's kind of a zen to it. Maybe the fact that uh, I rarely came into contact with with uh, dishes, let alone my own kitchen during the campaign. Most of our email, uh, most of our media, meals were actually in vehicles because we were moving around so quickly. Uh, and so just getting off of the table instead of my lap in an SUV, let alone uh, being able. To, I, I know it's strange. I hated doing the dishes when I was a kid, but uh, since the question was things I did not expect to like. That's one of them. I'm also beginning to make my piece with furniture assembly, like I said earlier. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, sometimes those, those basic daily things that uh, when you become a presidential candidate uh, are no longer available to you. Uh, there, there's a certain, um, uh, uh, there's a certain effect that's positive from being reunited. With you. All right. So our next question. Again, we'll try it. Baron from Austin. Um, Baron asked, how can we rebuild our economy along new and fair lines? And what do you think of government bailouts for large corporations? Mm. Well, that's, uh, that's really the question of the day is, look, it's not only impossible, but it's also undesirable to go to the old economic arrangements we had. They were unsustainable to begin with. Um, let me point out one example that is really interesting and important. Uh, so the Senate passed the emergency economic package. And one of the things they did was they made sure that uh, they supported unemployment insurance funding enough that everybody would be able to live, at least for uh, the period of time that they were cutting. Some people pointed out that for some workers, those unemployment benefits were more than they had been making at their jobs. This is not evidence that the uh, unemployment uh, posi- uh, 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 benefits were too generous. They really were set based on what it takes to get by. It's showing that what people were actually making in their jobs, even full-time workers working very hard in some geographies, was not enough to live on. And so what we're seeing is even in the course of rising to respond to this emergency, we're seeing just how unsustainable some of the things that we had come to accept really are. And this is a chance to do something about it. Again, partly because we should, partly because we have to. And in that, across the, the terrifying uh, uh, danger of this situation, there's also a huge amount of opportunity. Uh, there's an opportunity here to rebuild our economy on fairer terms. But that means making sure that the voices of workers are heard. It means making sure the way that we compensate people corresponds to how uh, much value they're creating in the economy. You know, the very same workers who are being described as disposable, or at least treated as disposable, are now proving to be absolutely indispensable and literally called essential uh, by orders that tell them they need to keep working. We're talking about farm workers. We're talking about uh, healthcare workers, not just doctors and nurses, but people in those uh, uh, really lower paid positions. And we're talking about the people who make it possible for uh, cities to function. Obviously, the mayor, I've got a soft spot for the people who uh, are out there every day picking up the trash and making sure that the sewers flow and, and, and that our uh, our streets are, are, are paved. Our first responders. Uh, uh, so many people uh, are, uh, I think, demonstrating the value and the dignity of work in an economy that has come to reward wealth over work. This is our chance to do something about that. Uh, look, a, a lot of the old assumptions are going out the window. They have to. Uh, we're revealing, uh, as we already knew, but in new ways, that, that uh, our way of delivering health care uh, needs to go through uh, uh, through tremendous change to really serve everybody. Uh, and as for the, the question about bailouts, look, uh, uh, if any uh, corporation expects to be supported by taxpayers, there needs to be a, 
uh, an understanding that, uh, uh, that that will be transparent, that the funding will be directed toward the workers who are there and focused on keeping employees uh, okay, that there's got to be oversight, and that uh, the American taxpayer expects something in return. Uh, we're seeing that a lot of the small businesses were left behind. Uh, as you may know, there was uh, uh, there's a bill that's working its way through uh, as we speak on Capitol Hill. Um, uh, I believe the Senate came to terms, and now it's uh, largely going to come to uh, the House. Um, this is a chance to make sure that's framed up in a way that the support actually gets where it's most needed. Because if it just uh, routes through the banks, what's going to happen is the businesses with the best relationships with the banks get the first dibs on funding. Um, but this is more than just how we get through the next few weeks and, and the, the stimulus funding. Uh, this is about how to make sure that whatever we come out of this with is stronger and more sustainable as well as more equitable than what we had before. And because it's not going to be as simple as uh, just rewinding the status quo, this is our chance uh, in, in the same way that uh, every once in a while the country hits a moment that really transforms everything. This is our chance to do something about it. All right. Um, we're going to try, we're going to have one more question. We're going to try Ryan from Boston again. Ryan from Boston, are you able to unmute your line? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear yes. me now? Hello, Ryan. Hey, Pete, how are you? Great to see you. Good, welcome. Um, so my question is a bit personal um, because my... Uh, my husband is actually running for Congress in Massachusetts. Um, he's running against an right. incumbent Democrat. And I'm kind of hoping you can give some insight into what your endorsement process will be, um, as well as when you're, you think you're going to start rolling out some endorsements. Yes, yeah, so definitely uh, invite his campaign to, to reach out to uh, uh, the Windy Era team led by, by Marcus, who's been moderating this call. And uh, there are several things that, that we're going to be uh, looking at. Uh, we're looking for leaders who uh, look to the future uh, with uh, the kind of generational energy that was an important part of our campaign. Uh, I'm looking for uh, leaders who are uh, pioneering. Sometimes that means uh, being a little different from, from uh, some of your constituents uh, in terms of uh, uh, your approach or your style. Bring something new uh, to a district. Uh, I'm looking for people who've demonstrated the qualities that were so important to us in the campaign, commitment to service, the belief in the concept of belonging, the campaign that organizes itself in ways that rhyme with uh, what we called our rules of the road, the values that were so important in our race. Uh, and so uh, that process is, is underway. Uh, and uh, would certainly welcome uh, uh, you and uh, your husband's campaign and, and also anybody uh, uh, on this call who uh, is following, whether you're personally involved with it or, uh, or, or just have an eye on it. Uh, you know, I, of all people, should uh, uh, live up to the understanding that, that not every great candidate uh, is somebody that, uh, uh, that you have, you've heard of or who has national attention. So we know that uh, sometimes an out-of-the-way race can produce a phenomenal leader. And uh, we'll be excited to hear about these candidates and uh, uh, to support as many as we can. Great. And I think we've got that. Sounds perfect. That's Thank time. you. Thanks, Ryan. I think we've got time for one more question. It's a question that's uh, been similar to a lot uh, that we've seen in the group chat. Uh, but it's uh, from Judy from Hollis. Judy, are you on the line? If you are, unmute your line. All right, well, I'll ask Judy's question is, what can I do to, to help support Win the Era besides donations, which I've already done, thank you, Judy, at the local, state, and federal levels? <laughs> all right, well, uh, yes, first of all, thank you, Judy, for, uh, for contributing. And uh, uh, there are several things that, that are important to us. So uh, um, first of all, I'm glad you mentioned local, state, and federal. Because, uh, uh, again, uh, obviously we care about federal offices from the presidency on through to Congress, but uh, think about how important it is, uh, for example, with democracy on the line in a country where most of our elections are organized uh, by either county officials or state officials or both, uh, our democracy is being handled by people, some of whom are on the ballot this November. Just one example of why it's so important at 
level. And so uh, in addition to uh, obviously needing the resources to work with, uh, we will be lifting up the names of, of, of candidates that we think uh, uh, are, uh, are really important to support. Uh, obviously, it'll be a limited number. We won't be able to, uh, uh, to, to uh, actively endorse everybody who deserves support, but uh, a spread of people who really uh, represent the, those values. As we uh, release those, those lists, uh, we'll strongly uh, encourage uh, anybody who is part of this community of supporters to uh, also come through and uh, support those campaigns directly. If it's anywhere near you, you can knock on doors for them. If it's uh, uh, somebody that um, you think might be connected up to a particular community of supporters that, that uh, you have access to, you could make that link. Uh, so uh, part of it's about funding, but there's a lot more to it than that. Um, also, Win the Era is not only going to be about supporting individual campaigns. Part of why we're building a nonprofit organization, a 501c4, uh, is to uh, make sure that, uh, uh, that we're lifting up issues that are important. Uh, and so we will be looking to you to help spread good information about uh, the response to the pandemic. Uh, for example, uh, again, this uh, body of work that, uh, that I've been working this week to lift up uh, about the relationship between testing and reopening. Um, but also uh, the, the issues that we're going to continue seeking to give voice to, uh, questions of racial equity that were addressed by uh, the Douglas Plan that are very much at stake in, in elections around the country, uh, a vision for national security that understands, uh, especially in the COVID era, that 21st century threats from uh, pandemics to cybersecurity problems to climate change deserve more attention, and many other issues that uh, I'm going to be working to lift, uh, lift up helping to spread the word. We have uh, uh, upcoming uh, uh, efforts on the, uh, whether it's uh, media appearances or eventually, we, we hope, uh, uh, being able to uh, get back to uh, more in-person gatherings as soon as it's safe. Uh, so uh, safe to say that there are a lot of ways to, to be involved. Please keep an eye on emails that come through on social media feeds, and uh, you'll see more and more of the work that we're doing uh, to, uh, to really make good on the values that brought us together in the campaign. All right. Well, thank you so much, Mayor. And I uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us uh, this evening. Uh, we look forward to talking to you all again soon. Have a good night. So great seeing you. Thanks so much for joining us, everyone. Thank you.